So we have to start and uh, <coughs> my du uh, duty uh, is to introduce Antonio Helscher and I will do it in Russian. Antonio Helscher uh, с 1975 года занимает uh, пост профессора классической археологии в Гейдельбергском университете. В разные годы он был приглашенным профессором в университете Неаполя, в Колумбийском университете в Нью-Йорке, в университете Энн-Арбор и в Американской академии в Риме. В 2004 году э, Тоня Хельшер был приглашен в качестве э, профессора в Беркли и прочитал курс лекций э, на общую тему «Роль визуального в Древней Греции и Риме». Главная область исследований э, Тоня Хельшера – общественные памятники и политическая иконография. Э, ей посвящены его монографии «Виктория Романа», это 1967 год, о римской богине Победы и греческие исторические изображения. В своих следующих работах он изучал функции и использование изображений в контексте общественной жизни, прежде всего в классической Греции, и семиотические аспекты художественных форм, которым была посвящена его книга «Римский язык изображений как семиотическая система». Она была переведена в 1995 году на итальянский, на английский под названием «The Language of Images in Roman Art». Сейчас профессор Хельшер работает над большим проектом «Политика и памятники в Древней Греции и Риме». Профессор Хельшер, пожалуйста. Yeah, let me start by saying my deepest gratitude to Professor Grinzer and to the organizer of this conference for the invitation to this wonderful and most prestigious place. Uh, my wife and I, we are very grateful for this. Uh, we also have to apologize for not attending the uh, beginning of this conference yesterday, we had already made our plans and bought our tickets uh, before the change of the schedule and we could, unfortunately, we could not change. But now we are here and it's really wonderful. To, uh, we are very happy to be uh, here. Uh, as you see, I'm going to speak on the actuality of myths in ancient Greece and Rome. Uh, as an essay uh, in categorization. Uh, myths, uh, yeah. myths in Greek and Roman antiquity, uh, <clears throat> as we all know, were not just exciting or enjoyable fairy tales, but had an enormous actual impact on ancient societies from archaic times to late antiquity. Myths were not a matter of erudite education, but an integral part of social life, they were omnipresent in literature, in political debates and social discourses, as well as in images, in public spaces, religious places, on tombs and in private houses. Ancient societies lived with the figures and events of myth. In this context, the media of texts on the one hand and images on the other, of literature and the visual arts, go in many respects together, complementing each other, as has been shown in numerous contributions of classical scholarship during the last two generations. Yet within this general frame of common themes and issues, there are important differences regarding the functions and capacities of these two media. As a medium of communication, texts are more narrative and discursive, Art is more representative. Texts serve argumentation. Art achieves presentification. As a medium of contents, literature is more a transporter of its author's personal views and concepts. Art is more oriented towards the general public of buyers and users, their exigencies, expectations, and mentalities. In this sense, literature is more individual, art is more collective and social. As historians, we should be aware of these differences, 
for they determine the reach and the substance of what we can gain from our sources. In this contribution, I'm going to focus on images of myths in Greek and in Greek art as a medium of social discourses. This means to ask for the significance of the mythical past for the societies of the actual present for which the images were made and in which they were used. Of course, this is not a new approach. Myths in texts and images have exhaustively been interpreted as specific intentional expressions and messages within specific historical societies and situations. What is largely missing, however, is a general reflection on the cultural premises and categories underlying the use of myths in political and social life. A basic <coughs> question concerns the ontological status of myths. To start with a famous example, the Parthenon is decorated with a series of metopes depicting four founding myths of Greek identity. On the east front, the battle of the gods against the giants. On the south side, the fight of the Melapiths against the centaurs. On the west front, the defense battle of the Athenians against the Amazons. And on the north side, the fall of Troy. Scholars rightly agree that these are primordial fights of exponents of Greek order of life against counterforces of evil, sacrilege, and chaos. They also agree that these mythical fights are conceived as analogies to the present-time victorious fight of the Greeks against the barbarian uh, Persians. This analogy, however, is defined by scholars with an irritating variety of terms. Often, the myths are termed similes or metaphors or even allegories of the Persian wars. In this sense, the defensive combats against the Lapiths and the Amazons would symbolize <clears throat> the defensive land battles of Marathon and Plataea. The offensive war against Troy would signify the later conquest of Asia Minor uh, <clears throat> by the Athenian army. This, however, leads to the crucial question why the Greeks would have preferred this kind of indirect allusion instead of the direct representation of these historical events. Indeed, the well-known cycle of paintings in the Stoa Poikili in the Athenian Agora points into another direction. It contained two mythical battles, the fight of the Athenians against the Amazons and the Greeks' conquest of Troy, together with the historical battle of the Athenians against the Persians at Marathon and a contemporaneous encounter of the Athenians and Argives against Sparta. Here, a juxtaposition of the historical reality and a metaphorical allusion to the same events would make no sense at all. Quite evidently, the mythical events are not meant to be symbolic substitutes of contemporary reality, they are conceived as real early predecessors of the historical battles. The ontological status of myths is the reality of a primordial past. The heroes of myth are real big figures, the feats and destiny of which serve as models of life, positive or negative, for those societies that live with these myths. Myths are real authoritative examples of human behavior in critical situations, reflecting general possibilities of action, the ambivalence of decisions, and the questions of destiny and responsibility in social life. Through their adoption as examples of virtue and behavior, they create a bridge between the primordial past and the present time societies. This bridge, however, needs further reflection. For it is not at all self-evident why and how the distant past of primordial times can get its authoritative actuality for much later historical societies. If we ask for specific connections between the mythical past and the actual presence, we have to distinguish four different modes. 
First mode is gene genealogical references. The genealogical mode means claiming one's descent from glorious ancestors of the mythical past. By claiming a genealogical descent, present time leaders could claim some inherited valor and capacities for themselves. Well-known examples are Alexander descending from Heracles and Achilles and Augustus from Aeneas. Second mode, local references. The local mode means emphasizing the powerful presence of a hero or heroine, mostly in their tomb, within the realm of a specific community or family. By referring to a local hero or heroine and his or her famous myths, their successors could claim the efficient protection of their territory and support for their actions by their heroic protagonists. Examples are Theseus in Athens, Agamemnon at Argos, or Helena at Sparta. Third mode is paradigmatic references. The paradigmatic mode means accepting and imitating great models of myth, such as Heracles or Achilles, and their glorious deeds. Paradigmatic models are on principle independent of genealogical affiliation or local connection. Each ruler, general or warrior could choose Heracles or Achilles as his paradigmatic model of virtue. And every polis could proclaim the, gigant the gigantomachy or the Trojan War as its great model in its struggle for order and justice against foreign enemies. These are purely paradigmatic models open for all those who felt up to the model of the great figures of myth. Fourth mode is assimilation and identification. The last and most ambitious step is made when present time persons are conflated and even identified with gods or heroes of the mythical past as a new Heracles or new Dionysus or as Zeus or Jupiter on earth. These categories of mythological references are not exclusively separated from each other. In particular, genealogical ancestors and local heroes can also possess paradigmatic qualities. But categorically, they can be distinguished by their different capacities. And these different capacities uh, are the following. Regarding the use of myth, Genealog genealogical myths serve above all the interests and of individuals and families, while local myths serve the claims of communities. Paradigmatic models are particularly suited in open public competition for rank and power, while identification serves the claims of rulers and monarchs for charismatic uniqueness. Conceptually, Genealogical and local references insist on power as a possession, while paradigmatic references, as well as assimilation and identification, focus on personal capacities. The genealogical descendants of great heroes possess a specific prestige. The protégé of a local hero possess, uh, possess uh, the territory protected by him. Both genealogical and local references do not so much focus on the own personal qualities and capacities of present time individuals and groups, but on their authority and power inherited from and conferred upon them by the heroes of myth. Conversely, Paradigmatic references, as well as assimilation and identification, make big claims to exceptional capacities, comparing present time persons or peoples and their achievements to the paradigm of heroic myths. Strategically, genealogical and local references are exclusive. Paradigmatic references are competitive. Genealogical ancestry and local presence privilege specific families, groups, and places, excluding all other descents and places. 
In contrast to this, paradigmatic references are fundamentally inclusive. Claims were justified by the same models. Competitors had to demonstrate that they were the worthiest imitators of Heracles or the most valuable successors of the Greek heroes fighting against Troy. And as a consequence, these different references to myth were adopted in different social situations. The symposium was a social event of communication in which paradigmatic references to myth were most relevant. Political affairs, on the other hand, internal struggles as well as external conflicts, were often fought out with more exclusive references to genealogical and local myths. This has obvious consequences for the mythological imagery within these, real, uh, these realms. Symposium vessels are mostly decorated with paradigmatic myths, while political monuments often tend to emphasize local myths and heroes, and great personal ambitions to power are increasingly expressed by genealogical references. Finally, as we shall see, the different modes of reference to myths played different roles in different periods of Greek and Roman history. In what follows, I'm going to present and discuss some specific concrete examples of the uses of Greek and Roman myths in various periods and historical situations of Greek and Roman history. I start with archaic Greece, where paradigmatic myths of, of aristocratic valor are predominant. In archaic Greek art, on vases, as, in temple, <coughs> as well as in temple decoration, the world of Homer plays a rather limited role. The most characteristic hero of this period is Heracles. As a general model of human valor, arete, Heracles is not limited by genealogical or local boundaries. He is the paradigmatic panhellenic hero par excellence. As a social model, Heracles is not an autonomous hero, but accomplishes his deeds in the service of King Eurystheus. Thereby, he widely differs from Gilgamesh, the hero king of, of Uruk. In the Orient, political power and personal heroism are identical, while in Greece, the greatest hero, who is celebrated as a model of unlimited excellence, is nevertheless depending on some major representative of political order. This corresponds precisely to the structure of early Greek city-states, where the institutions of political power were weak, where big aristocrats unfolded almost unlimited ambitions, but nevertheless were subjected <clears throat> to an overarching political system. This model has two significant anthropological aspects. First, this hero relies in his deeds exclusively on his pure physical capacities. In his first struggle, he strangles the lion of Nemea with his bare hands. Later, he is traditionally equipped with a primitive club. Very rarely, Heracles uses more elaborate weapons, such as a sword or a bow and arrow. He is the protagonist of the Greek culture of the pure male body trained in athletic exercise. As such, secondly, Heracles is never an absolute victor over all his opponents. His struggles bring him into extreme situations of danger and labor. The glory of victory is based on immense agony and exhaustion. Heracles' deeds are, and, uh, are achievements of the early Greek polis civilization in a very <clears throat> precise sense. The lion of Nemea threatens the herds of cattle in the pastoral land and the countryside roads. Uh, by overcoming this beast, Heracles protects the polis territory and its ways of communication to its neighbors. The dragon of Lerna impedes the access to the great extra-urban fountain. By cutting off its hundred heads, Heracles ensures the city's water supply, which is essential for the community's survival. 
Thus, in his first deeds, Heracles appears as the protagonist of civilization, of pasture, and of water supply. Afterwards, the hero overcomes the wild centaurs on two occasions. First, when they disturb the banquet that is offered to him by the single good centaur, Pholos. Then, when the centaur Nessos tries to rape his bride, Dionaira. In these myths, two fundamental institutions of Greek societies are threatened by ferocious and libidinous monsters. The symposium, the connecting custom of male aristocrats, and marriage, the ritual of connection between the sexes. Here, Heracles is conceived as the protagonist of social connectivity. Later, Heracles is reported to have traveled to faraway regions near to the end of the world. In the east to the frightening belligerent Amazons in order to conquer the girdle of their queen. In the west to the monstrous Gerion with his tribal body, heavily armed, from whom he had to abduct a famous herd of cattle. These are myths mirroring the experiences of those keen seafarers who at this time undertook sea voyages to far distant regions from where they brought the riches of natural resources and cultural production to Greece. In these lands, they must have met people and animals of totally unknown appearance and behavior from which they must have expected the most threatening encounters and dangers, just like Gerion and the Amazons. Now I come to classical Greece, where local myths of patriotic identity predominate. While in the visual arts of archaic times, the themes of paradigmatic myths were largely a common possession of all Greeks, the classical period of the 5th century BC is stamped by a new emphasis on myths of local significance. The reason for this development is a new emphasis on political identity that permeates the entire Greek world. In the, war, in the wars against the expanding empire of the Persians, as all of you know, the Greeks developed a new mentality of Hellenic identity opposed to non-Hellenic, so-called barbarians, as they were called. And in the following internal conflicts among the Greeks themselves, individual Greek city-states and alliances increasingly insisted on their own ideology of polis identity. In Athens, One of the main factors of this ideology was the creation of a new patriotic hero. During the archaic period, sorry, the myth of Theseus killing the Minotaur was represented in art all over Greece. But at the end of the 6th century, the presence of Theseus is almost exclusively limited to Athens. A new cycle of deeds is created and prominently represented not only on vases, but also on the metopes of the Athenian treasury at Delphi. Theseus is conceived as an equivalent to Heracles. But whereas Heracles accomplishes his deeds in all parts of Greece and in the world beyond, Theseus overcomes brigands and monsters on the way from Troitzene to Athens, thus securing the safe access to his mother city. Accordingly, this myth is now almost totally restricted to the art of Athens. Soon afterwards, the hero's patriotic role was emphatically implanted in Attic soil when Cimon transferred his bones from Skyros and buried them in his sanctuary in the heart of Athens. This new local and patriotic significance of Theseus is particularly evident in a new version of the myth of the Amazons. Whereas in archaic times Heracles had attacked the Amazons in their far-off homeland, 
Now, these, the Amazons, were reported to have crossed the Aegean Sea, to have besieged Athens, and successfully been repulsed by the Athenians under their king Theseus. <clears throat> it has rightly been recognized that this version is a mythical mirror account of the Persian attack on, per on Athens in 480 BC, and indeed Aeschylus lets the Amazons attack the Athenian Acropolis precisely from the Areopagus, where according to Herodotus, to Herodotus, the Persians had made their camp before conquering the Acropolis. This new construction of local patriotic mythology entails two general aspects that need some more reflection. First, myth and present time reality are brought into a tight reciprocal inter interrelation. The explicit function of the myth is to serve as an exemplary model of the past for the situations and actions of the present. But the, impl the implicit consequence of this interrelation is that the myth, in order to serve as a model, is made compatible with and assimilated to the actual present situation. Explicitly, the present follows the model of myth, but implicitly, the myth follows the model of the present. Secondly, this actualization can lead to a continuous modification of myths. On 5th century Athenian basis, the fight, as uh, <coughs> on, the, on the left here, the fight against the Amazons is depicted in big battle scenes, mirroring the big battles of the Confederate Greeks against the Persians, as we may imagine the battle pieces uh, in the paintings of the Stoa Poikile. Indeed, on the crater from Spina, uh, on the right, uh, three fleeing Amazons are depicted. One of them named is, uh, is named Pesianassa, after the founder of the Stoa Poikile, a certain Pesianax. So this is a reference to <coughs> the painting. Um, another Amazon, however, is named Dolope, after the native tribe of the Dolopes, who lived on the island of Skyros, from where the bones of Theseus had been brought to Athens. Thus, the hostile Amazons of myth were assimilated not only to the, per to the Persians, but also to the hostile Dolopes, whom the Athenians had to defeat for obtaining the relics of their national hero. Most prominently, <clears throat> the Amazonomachy was depicted on the shield of the Athena Parthenos in the Parthenon. You see that on the right. Ah, sorry. No, sorry. Yeah. Here we are. Sorry. The main figures of this composition seem to have been the patriotic hero Theseus and the arch artist Daedalus. Thus, the mythical community of Athens is represented under the leadership of a great statesman and a great artist. And this is obviously a mythical prefiguration of Pericles' concept of Athens as the actual center of Greece, equal in its political power and its cultural splendor. Finally, in the later 5th century BC, a squat Lekythos in Napoli again shows the battle against the, the Amazons under the leadership of Theseus, but here he is accompanied by two heroes named Munichos and Phalaros, after the two harbors of Athens, Munichia and Phalaron. In this scene, Athens is emphatically conceived as a big sea power, which was the basis of the city's political ambitions during the Peloponnesian War. Thus, in classical times, a new emphatic claim to political identity provoked a strong emphasis on local myths. This new focus on the political reality leads to an intense reciprocal interrelation between mythical models and the past 
<coughs> of, uh, between mythical models of the past and the changing experiences and ideologies of present time communities and individuals. To come to the end, just Hellenistic monarchies uh, with genealogical references and claims of identity. The monarchies of Hellenistic Greece and the Roman Empire produced new uses of the, tradi of the traditional myths. Beginning with Alexander the Great, the claims of the Hellenistic kings to unique personal charisma could no longer be fulfilled by references to paradigmatic or local myths, since both of them were also open to be used by other individuals or by larger social units. In this respect, genealogical references to myth were, more, were, were much more efficient. Alexander the Great traced his lineage back to Heracles on his father's side and to Achilles on his mother's side. Both heroes had been claimed before him by leading or ambitious statesmen as great paradigmatic models of virtue and behavior, but now Alexander monopolized them as his ancestors. He was even equated to them in a reciprocal assimilation between the mythical hero and the present time ruler. On the one hand, his famous silver tetradrachms which you see in the middle, show Heracles sometimes with Alexander's characteristic hairstyle, the Anastole, <coughs> assimilating the heroic model to his actual imitator. Likewise, early Hellenistic coins of the city of Larissa Cremaste in Thessaly, you see it on the right, show Achilles as his forefather with his complex personal ha hairstyle. On the other hand, on the so-called Alexander sarcophagus of King Abdalonimus of Sidon, <coughs> Alexander appears himself with a helmet in the shape of a lion's head that is as a reincarnation of Heracles. The unique power of such genealogical references becomes evident in the late Roman Republic. Up to this time, the Romans honored Aeneas as their common founder hero and as their paradigmatic model of virtue and pietas. However, when Julius Caesar proclaimed Aeneas as the forefather of his own family, the gens Julia, and you see coins of him on the left, he successfully monopolized this collective hero for himself. All other ancestors of other families must have appeared inferior to this national founder hero of the Julii. Likewise, <coughs> all great army leaders uh, <coughs> of that period, such as Sulla and Pompey, honored Venus as the great paradigmatic <coughs> goddess of victory and pleasure, until Julius Caesar promoted her as Aeneas' mother, thus claiming her exclusively as the divine ancestress, ancestress of the gens Julia. By this genealogical ideology, Julius Caesar laid the foundations <clears throat> on which Augustus could erect the architecture of his imperial myth. To conclude, all myths of the past are created from the perspective and for the actual purposes and goals of present time societies and individuals. Classical scholarship has investigated these uses of myths in many fruitful and convincing case studies. What I wanted to demonstrate is that a systematic analysis of the general categories of these uses can help to understand how these strategies of mythical references work in actual historical situations and circumstances. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor uh, uh, Hölscher. Uh, who would like, uh, 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 please? Uh, 
sorry, such, but... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, uh, of course, I mean, you know, and uh, as a philologi uh, philologist know that much uh, better, that, of course, uh, these, uh, these heroes change over their, uh, their character. Yeah? And Heracles, uh, of course, uh, uh, as in the, in the simile, uh, as in the choice between virtue and, uh, uh, I mean, Protagoras, yeah, this is obviously a new, a very new uh, aspect of, of Heracles, which has nothing to do with, with his uh, sixth century predecessor, let's say. Yeah? Uh, the, and so, I mean, uh, they, they change continuously their, their character, their, their, uh, their actual aspects. Uh, the group of Miron is a very interesting uh, thing. Yeah? I uh, don't know whether everybody knows, uh, uh, knows this. Um, uh, in, in Samos, uh, the sculptor Miron is uh, reported to have uh, created a group of the introduction of Heracles uh, to, uh, uh, to the Olympus, uh, a group containing Zeus, Heracles, and Athena. Yeah? Uh, my interpretation, and I'm almost sure that it's, uh, it can't be otherwise, is <laughs> that this group was erected after the revolt uh, <clears throat> of Samos uh, by, the, uh, by the supporters of Athens, uh, um, <clears throat> by the supporters of Athens, uh, <clears throat> the new democratic uh, regime in Samos installed by Athens after having conquered Samos. Yeah? Uh, the interesting thing is that uh, it was erected in the sanctuary of Hera, uh, but Hera doesn't play any role there. Instead, Athena uh, uh, is, uh, uh, appears yeah, as the goddess who introduces Heracles. So it's, uh, it's a very, yeah, and Heracles, in a way, uh, is, uh, is used as an example, not, uh, I mean, he is not a local hero of Athens, but he was also uh, very much venerated in Athens. And uh, there is a, a version saying that the Marathonians were the first uh, <coughs> to, uh, to, to venerate Heracles. So Heracles had also uh, strong, uh, uh, strong Athenian uh, affiliations. Yeah? And so he could be used uh, <coughs> to... Uh, uh, to impose Athenian power on, Ath uh, on Samos in this very specific uh, situation. I'm sorry, and is it the, his, his military side of his character that, that is stressed? Uh, uh, in a way, yeah, probably yes, yeah. Probably he is also used as a military uh, hero. Один очень короткий вопрос, пожалуйста. Thanks a lot. I really appreciate the idea of systematization uh, of uh, the usages of myths. But my 
Well, I have a minor question concerning Thucydides. Uh, you are saying that his battle uh, with Minotaur uh, had pan Hellenic status uh, from the very beginning, yeah. not just Athenian status. So I just uh, wonder uh, the reasons for this interpretation as a pan Hellenic event. And, but this main question is what we are doing with uh, you know, mythological typology and uh, comparative uh, uh, issues here. For instance, you said about the uh, difference between Gilgamesh, for instance, and uh, uh, Heracles. But basically, Gilgamesh is doing the same thing. Uh, he, he's uh, fighting the bull, he's good seafaring, Siegfried does similar things to Heracles, and so on and so forth. How does it fit in your specific Greek uh, pattern of interpretation? What I, uh, yeah, two things. The first was. Um, Just Tizius as a part of the uh, hero again. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I left out uh, one uh, slide. Uh, <coughs> when I uh, spoke about Heracles and Gerion and the Amazons, mm -hmm. yeah, there is a whole horizon of myths, uh, particularly in the 7th century, on vases, mm -hmm. coming from all parts of Greece. Uh, depicting heroes um, going to the end of the world and, uh, and defeating uh, wild monsters. Yeah? Perseus, uh, let's just go back. I just left that out for reasons of time. Uh, Perseus killing the Gorgon, uh, Bellerophon killing the Chimaira, Jason uh, going to Colchis, and so on. Yeah? Uh, all these myths must uh, mirror some or uh, interpret, in a way, uh, the situation of Greeks uh, going to, to the far ends uh, of, uh, of the world. And one of these is also, uh, in my view, is Theseus. Uh, and that's why I uh, showed you uh, some, uh, <coughs> some, well, this comes from Peloponnesus. There are others from Sicily, and so on. Yeah? So Theseus goes, uh, in the seventh century, goes in, uh, stands in this horizon. Yeah? In the sixth century, and especially at the end of the 6th century, Theseus is monopolized as an Athenian uh, uh, hero. This is what I have. Uh, Heracles, of course, uh, and I absolutely agree that he practically does the same deeds uh, as Gilgamesh. What I find interesting is that he is in the service of another, um, yeah, of Eurystheus and that Heracles, as the biggest, is not autonomous. Yeah? And this, uh, to me, seems a, a very telling difference uh, <clears throat> from, from Gilgamesh, yeah? who is uh, the, the biggest hero is also the king. The king yeah? And uh, so yeah, that, that's what I meant, yeah? that, that even the biggest are, in a way, subject to some authority, even if this authority is weak, yeah? uh, as the Greek polis of the 7th century was weak, and there was place for, for, for big personalities uh, exceeding the limits of, uh, of, of the polis norms, nevertheless, <laughs> they belong to that. Unity, yes. If there is no other question, I will ask something, if you don't mind. <clears throat> so, um, thank you very much for these cate categories of actualizing uh, references. For the text, it's, uh, it's pretty clear, because, uh, so, <clears throat> although it's sometimes difficult to... Uh, uh, to conceive the, um, the third, the paradigmatic, for example, without including a part of genealogical, because it's bound, and also the assimilation. So we see it with uh, um, Alexander, for example, because behind the um, assimilation identification, there is uh, something genealogical, and it's 
a bit no. mixed. But so also it it functions pretty well. And uh, but for iconography, it's completely different. And I'm wondering how far uh, it is possible to uh, uh, to apply this uh, uh, system. So you showed some some pictures, but you you said it mirrors, etc. But how are you sure that uh, it's rather something paradigmatic or rather something genealogical with 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 pictures? And really, I I'm always strict. Uh, struck by the fact that interpret images uh, request something completely different and different patterns, and I'm uh, always uh, a bit skeptical with uh, uh, an interpretative system which works for both. <laughs> uh, absolutely, I, I understand very well your uh, your, your concerns, uh, and of course, I mean images, in a way represent but do not give backgrounds do not uh, they they do not tell yeah uh, and so uh, i'm very much aware that <coughs> other scholars uh, they uh, they are much more in favor let's say of genealogical references on Athenian vases, yeah? or on genealogical references on uh, temple decoration, Sicilian. Yeah? Uh, all that is possible. Uh, you can't, I mean, uh, you can't, uh, uh, sagt man da, um, falsify. Uh, this kind of supposition, yeah, because it's always possible that there is somebody who, that there was somebody of whom we do not know anything, but who traces himself back to to some of these of these heroes, yeah. But all this is invented, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> so where we have it, yeah, uh, and uh, for me, uh, it's uh, it's almost obvious that uh, if you look at the Let's say at the uh, at the at the big numbers, yeah, uh, genealogical um, uh, references do not work very much, uh, <clears throat> uh, not very well uh, in, uh, in in Athenian vase painting. And then, if you uh, just think of uh, of the situation of a symposium, yeah, what should they do? Yeah, I mean, uh, what should they think? Yeah, uh, the the uh, the person who has invited makes you uh, makes you uh, uh, drink from vessels with with his genealogy, and what do the others? So, um, and uh, actually, it doesn't. Uh, uh, it's almost. Uh, impossible to imagine a concrete situation where vessels with specific genealogical themes were selected for this and that. I mean, we have tomb, uh, tombs mm -hmm. where various myths are together. I fully agree that it's, genealogical it's, 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 perspective it, is overestimated yeah, in, in, it's, in the it's reading very of vases. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, but sometimes, for example, you, you said uh, these vase with um, uh, Monikios and uh, yeah. and Phalera. So yeah. the interpretation as paradigmatic seems to be quite clear because it, uh, effectively with the name, yeah. uh, so it appears like this. But yeah. this but, but there, there are many cases where it's more difficult to know uh, where to it bends. So more this or more this. Yeah, of course. Yeah, uh, I mean. Uh, it's because it's not like a text, a text it's not, tell, and an and, and image, not like, image not like is just mirroring like or presenting. Because, because images are, in this Very respect, difficult. never explicit. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, now uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Fernando Helscher. Фернандо Хершер является профессором классической археологии в университете Констанца. Главная область ее интересов – греческая и римская иконография, которые посвящены ее книге «Значение архаических изображений звериных боев». 
миры римских изображений от реальности к образу и обратно. Профессор Хельшер занимается также археологией и иконологией греческого и римского ритуала и историей греческих культовых статуй. Недавно вышла ее новая книга «Божественная сила в изображении. Археологические исследования греческих статуй». No, Moscow. So, um, as Tony, you heard him um, already said, I'm very grateful to be here and thank all the organizers very much. And uh, since we didn't speak about our papers, um, I can tell you that now I go to the paradigmatic uh, category, presenting uh, Ayas, um, Ayas as a hero with a paradigmatic character. <clears throat> when the Greeks dis destroyed Troy, as it's well known from the Iliad, from the little Iliad and the Iliopersis, there were bloody acts of the conquerors similar to those that occurred in every conquest of a city after long years of brutal battles on both sides. But two actions that had exceeded by far all the norms of warfare were the deeds of Achilles' son Neoptolemus, who killed Priamus at the altar of Zeus Hercaeus, and of Ayas, who pursued Cassandra and dragged her away from the statue of the city goddess um, Athena, of the Athena, Athena with an utmost violence. These two outrages are to be seen in the same image on the famous red-figured Vivencio Hydria by the Cleophrates painter in Naples around 480. Neoptolemus, is a, uh, you see it on the right side of the picture, is about to kill Priamus, who has taken refuge at the altar of Zeus Hercaeus, the god of the household. He is already hurt. Blood comes down on head and shoulder. He covers his head, not to protect himself, but rather of grief about his slain grandson, Astyanax, stretched out on his lap. A brutal murder, one of the most brutal we have in images, of an old man and a young child on an altar that instead of the bloody sacrifice offered to the god, evidently is stained by human blood showing clearly the extinction of the royal house of Troy. Juxtaposed to Neoptolemus is on the left side. You see it here again more clearly, the, the brutal murder of, um, of Priamos and the bloody stains. Juxtaposed to Neoptolemus is on the left side of the vessel's shoulder Ayas, who fiercely attacks the crouching Cassandra grasping with his left hand in her hair and threatening her with his word. With her left, Cassandra wraps the statue of Athena as a supplicant. The other outstretched arm is directed towards the aggressor to plead for mercy. Grieving Trojan women accompany her and also the palm tree seems to suffer, bending down. Only in later literature of Hellenistic time, this action was described as an act of rape, but erotic connotation was already inherent in the early images of this crime. The way Cassandra in this vast painting is shown quasi naked does not leave any doubt that the painter wanted to allude to the rape, since the princess close to Apollo with the ability of foreseeing the future would never be dressed that is undressed in this way. This outrage of Ayas was a severe sacrilege since he ignored that Cassandra, as supplicant, has taken refuge at the goddess Athena, the main goddess of Troy. From written sources, we know that the dragging of Cassandra from the statue of Athena, to whom she clung fast, was so vehement that she pulled the statue out of its base. Here you see the, the whole uh, picture. Ayas, as a transgressor, was already in the beginning of the sixth century shown on a shield bunt relief and in vast painting as well. 
The Athena does not stay as a statue on the base. It's obvious that the statue is meant by the painters since Cassandra embraces her what nobody could do with the goddess herself. Many examples in the following decades <clears throat> are known to us, often seems more or less a confrontation of Arias and Cass Athena, Cassandra being rendered as a small child, sometimes hidden behind the shield of the goddess. At the end of the sixth century, the painters wanted to clarify that it was a statue, putting her on a base. But nevertheless, the goddess in these years was not just a piece of stone or better wood. This is demonstrated by Alekithos in Gila, where she sends a snake, helping her in punishing the aggressive Ayas. So she herself sends the, the snake. It's, one is still on her shield, but she sends it that Ayas should be punished. Ayas, the son of Oilos, King of Locris was also called the Lesser Arias in contrast to the other Arias, the Great, the son of Telamon. In his behavior, the furor of Greek heroes was concentrated. He acted beyond Sophrosyne in self-control in a sort of dimming of consciousness. This story was part of the Iliopersis, a story we can imagine told as often as the events during the Trojan War of the Iliad. But why, this is the question of my talk, were the artists, especially the vast painters of the sixth and fifth century, so much interested in this topic? I think one can better understand the interest of the vast painters looking at the outrage of Arias, not isolated, but moreover in connection with that of Neoptolemus. We have already seen it on the first image where Neoptolemus and Arias were juxtaposed. The outrage of Neoptolemus killing Priamos on an altar is as well a frequent topic for the artist since the early 6th century. But our interest now is concentrated on the images of the two heroes together in the Hybris. The, we already have described one of the combinations on the Vivencio Hydria, showing the two heroes, in, it becomes obvious that it's not the aim of the painters to give evidence about a single hero, but instead about the broader topic war. Most of the vessels that show the two heroes together are painted around 500 BC, and in the first decades of the fifth century. On a cup by, the Onesimus, by Onesimus, once in the Villa Giulia in Rome, about 490 BC, with nine different scenes of the Iliopersis, the two outrages are exactly paralleled. In the tondo of the cup, it's, it's uh, uh, very fragmentary, uh, of the cup we see the slaughter of Priamos by Neoptolemus, whose furor is even enhanced since he throws the young Astyanax towards Priam, killing by that the grandfather with his own grandchild as a weapon. This motive apparently was invented in vast painting, while in the written sources, Astyanax was thrown from the city wall. Just in the same axis of the tondo, uh, in, in the round of the cup, the rape of Cassandra is shown. She again is naked in her beauty, but in a desperate situation, wrapping her arm around the statue. Only two, so you see it more clearly here. And here the Athena is on a base. And Cassandra again naked. Only two decades later on a crater in Boston, the two aggressors are again paralleled and the victims as well, outstretching their arm as if to ask for help in a helpful situation. You see Cassandra uh, puts her arm uh, towards Prime and Prime to Cassandra. What was the main interest of this parallel? Have the heroes been admired just for their transgression of normal behavior? Or moreover, was it to demonstrate in a critical way the bloodthirsty fear of Neoptolemus or the utmost lack of sexual control concerning Arias? 
I think one has to be very careful not to put our criteria of morally good and wrong on the ancient images. As some scholars have already demonstrated, splendor and transgression are two sides of the same medal. The Greek heroes like Arias, Neoptolemus, and especially Achilles would not have been admired models if they hadn't been transgressors as a consequence of an exaggerated opinion of themselves. But there was another aspect of the story. One could think of the implicit retribution that the gods exact from the transgressors. The, the divine vengeance itself is not the topic of the images, but some hints are given, like the palm tree in the Neoptolemus scene, since Neoptolemus' punishment was done exactly in the sanctuary of Apollo at Delphi. And the pose of Athena's statue may hint at her furor when she immediately, after the rape of Cassandra, rushed in order to churn up the sea and promise to destroy the Achaeans, described in a poem by Alcaeus. Indeed, the divine revenge of Athena did not only concern Aias himself, for the wrath of Athena was twofold. The sacrilegious act itself, and furthermore the behavior of the Achaeans, who did not punish Aias in a way he deserved it. Apparently, Aias took an oath in front of the Achaean leaders who refrained from punishing him. This we learn from Pausanias' description of a painting about five, uh, 450 BC by Polygnotus of Thasos in the Lestia, a sort of clubroom of the Canadians at Delphi. Pausanias, uh, I quote, Ayas, the son of Oilos, holding a shield, stands by an altar taken an oath about the outrage on Cassandra. Omnumenos hypertu es, es Cassandran tolmematos. The content of the oath is not named, but might be connected with the temple service in Athena's sanctuary at Troy, where two Locrian maidens every year until Roman times had to serve as retribution for the sacrilege of Ayas, as ancient authors tell us. For Athena, this promise was too weak. She apparently did not accept it and averted the departure, uh, the, the departure of the Achaeans. These, only then feeling the wrath of the goddess, decided to stone Ayas, but he escaped the punishment, seeking refuge, ironically, at the altar of Athena herself. It's a kind of tragic situation because there was no escape. The Achaeans only could appease Athena's wrath by violati vi violating again the sacred law of Hikazia at Athena's altar. The anger of the goddess in its emotional aggravation after she had helped the Achaeans during so many years of fight becomes evident in the di dialogue with Pose Poseidon in the Troades of Euripides. Uh, I quote, Athena says in her wrath, on them will Zeus also sends his rain and fearful hail and inky tempests from the sky, and he promises to grant me his thunderbolts to hurl on the Achaeans and fire the ships. And you, for your part, make the Aegean straight to roar with mighty billows and whirlpools and fill Eubius' hello bay with corpses, that Achaeans may learn henceforth to, re to reverence my temples and regard all other deities. Quote, in, uh, in, and in Apollodorus' epitome of the Nostoi, we, we read, after sacrificing, Agamemnon put to sea and touched at Tenedos. But Thetis came and persuaded Neoptolemus not to wait two days and to offer sacrifice, and he waited. But the others put to sea and encountered a storm of Tenos. For Athena entreated Zeus to send a tempest against the Greeks, and many ships foundered. And Athena threw a thunderbolt at the ship of Aias. And when the ship went to pieces, he made his way safe to a rock and declared that he was saved in spite of the attention of Athena. But Poseidon smote the rock with his trident and split it, and Aias fell into the sea and perished, and his body, being washed up, was buried by Thetis in Mykonos. Quote end. 
While Neoptolemus listened to the advice of grandmother Thetis, the others were not obedient at all, and their ships foundered. Moreover, Ayas boasted of being res rescued in spite of the wrath of Athena that sealed his fate and shows a double, double impious, impious man. Interestingly, in contrast to Neoptolemus, his character is by far more arrogant. With this, the crime of Neoptolemus appears in a more favorable light. He had to extinguish the house of Troy after the death of Hector, whose father Priam and his son Astyanax had to die, otherwise Troy would have been a menace with revenge on the Achaeans. It could be understood as a consequence in the logic of warfare, whereas Aya's deed had nothing to do with the war itself. He was impious and arrogant, and that was the reason for his early inglorious end, sent by Athena with the help of Poseidon. Herodotus, who is very regardful to religious transgressions that were understood as the causes for certain divine revenges, enumerates many examples in historical times. That means that in the fifth century, one was aware that transgressions was not only as reserved for barbarians, but also for strong and mighty Greeks. There are many examples how the gods punished sacrileges in historical times. One that happened about the time of our verses were read in Her we read in Herodotus. I quote, to Athens and Sparta, Xerxes sent no heralds to demand earth. And this he did for the following reason. When Darius had previously sent men with the same purpose, those who made the request were cast at the one city into the pit and at the other into a well, and bidden to obtain their earth and water for the king from these locations. What calamity, Herodotus says, befell the Athenians for dealing in this way with the heralds, I can say, save that their land and their city were laid waste. I think, however, that there was another reason for this and not the aforesaid. What follows in his text is a detailed account of the consequences the Spartans had to suffer for the wrong done to the heralds in their attempt to compensate. Herodotus knew that there must have been a wrath of the gods also towards the Athenians without being able to name it precisely. Arias and Neptolemus felt his, this wrath of, the, wrath of the gods, but one has to keep in mind that they were not understand as aggressors in a moral sense in the images. In the images one could blame them, but this was not the last word. Ne Neoptolemus did not end in a damnatio memoriae, but was venerated at Delphi to preside over the processions and uh, of heroes which are hon honored by many sacrifices. Quote, he died in the sanctuary of Apollo more or less by chance in a quarrel, Pinda Nemean 7, or by Apollo himself, Pinda in the Six Peian. Pinder, Pinder uh, around um, 485 in the Nemean version tells a positive end of Neoptolemus. The mighty son of Achilles, without any punishment, no moral reproach of a war criminal, though everybody knew the wrong he had done. In the same way, Ayas was the transgressor, but he also was an admired hero struck on the coins of the Opuntian Locrians, no, that's back, on the Opuntian Locrians. In the historical battle formations, there was always a place left for him in order to remember him as a model of strong warrior. We see by the modes of afterlife of the heroes that they served as admired models in their vigor and strength because and although their self-control was not perfect. This seems to me a crucial point for the self-image of the historical Athenians, not black and white, but gray. Um, if we look again 
at the Vivencia Hydria, we see more closely that even there the ambivalence of all the events that happened in the chaotic situation of a war was at the fore. For the crimes of the two parallel heroes, Ayas and Neoptolemus, are accompanied by un antithetic, positively connotated scenes after the destruction of Troy. You see on the left, Aeneas carries his old father on his shoulder while his son Ascanius follows him, a contrasting scene to that of the house of Priamus that was extinguished in the same image. And to the right, um, you see it, you see it uh, uh, above, the sons of Theseus, Demophon and Akamas, who rescue her old grandmother, Aitra, leading her home. Most of the images, with several scenes of the Trojan War, were painted around 500 and in the beginning of the 5th century BC, painted under the vivid impression of the destruction of Miletus and the tragedy by Phrynichos, the Mileto Halosis performed in 492. Even the shock after the sack by the Persians in 480, who had devastated Attica and especially Athens, could be in the mind of some later painters who did not illustrate the contemporary events but painted on the folio of its mental background. It was the war with its ambivalences the heroes that were driven by Furo on the one side, Neoptolemus and Ayas, and Mercy on the other, Aeneas and the sons of Theseus. Athena, in her protection of Cassandra, on the one hand, and of pursuing the sacrilege of Ayas with all the consequences, on the other hand, was a main figure of the Cassandra scene, and is surely not a chance that three, three vessels of the small group with combined scenes of the Trojan War were found on the Acropolis as gifts to the goddess. As gifts for Athena, not to accuse the heroes, but show her mighty engagement, not only in favor of the Achaeans during the battle, but also her concern with the sacrilege that was part of war atrocities. A similar war a few, a few year, years ago had turned the heads of the Athenians listen, listening to the reports of the destruction of Miletus. They were overwhelmed by the performance of the Mileto Halosis in such a way that this play was forbidden after its first performance because the emotions were felt destructive. We do not know the emotions of those who looked at the vases. May be that the distant mythical level helped to take the events of the time more calmly. Thank you for attention. So we have uh, time for uh, questions uh, uh, or discussion, please. Yes, uh, please. Uh -huh. Thank you very much. Uh, and I, uh, I totally agree that the idea of hero presumes uh, that uh, he should always transgress borders, uh, but uh, <coughs> that's uh, absolutely right. But, well, that's the idea of the hero in the myth. Uh, the, I, uh, the idea of the hero uh, in the classical uh, Athens uh, that could be something different. I heard. Do you think that this idea of uh, hero having rights, a right to do things, uh, well, atrocious, outrageous, was still embedded in the consciousness of the people of the, of the fifth century? That that would be my question because I, I agree that myth is written like that, but I'm not so sure about you know an Athenian carpenter uh, in the fifth century. But, uh, but uh, thank you very much for this interesting question. I um, uh, I, uh, I looked on the vases around 500, but for instance, the the rape of Cassandra was also uh, runs uh, uh, down to 400, and um, I think it's not. Um, I don't see the. 
um, a rigid um, uh, controversy uh, between the uh, atrocities and the good hero. I, I think he is the uh, uh, he is the hero because he does the atrocities. So imagine to kill in the in the images. The images are more, more outspoken than the than the uh, written sources. To kill a man with his grandchild, so you can't you can't invent anything uh, more uh, uh, more radical, uh, 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 bad, even if it's a war. And um, I think they were aware of that. And maybe, uh, as Tony Hölscher already mentioned, in the there was a discussion in the symposium. All the vessels are symposium vessels, so they. They, there was a discourse of um, how do we uh, judge on, on these uh, events. So they were venerated as heroes in the centuries, as I said, in, in Delphi for Neoptolemus and, and uh, in, in, in Locris for, for Ayas, but um, they were, th this other side was not, uh, uh, what was not forgotten, but it was part of the veneration. That was my point. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, please. Um, I, on the contrary, I, I thought uh, the reading was, it, it was dreadful, not uh, things happen like that in a war, but um, the, the heroes are so strong because they did this transgression. Yeah. So it doesn't really matter because they're mm -hmm. heroes. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. seems to be the argument that I'm hearing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 From an American perspective, that's a horrifying read of, yeah. of, of Iraq, for example. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's a good point. Uh, I have to think about this parallel. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Ah. And it was plausible and fit to observe these races and atrocities uh, in, 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 in the images. Uh, if, if you think that this is a result of. Yeah, not the result, but so I think the, the, uh, the, these stories just came to their mind. And um, you, uh, if, if I understood you right, you think that the crying, uh, looking at the, the Melito Hallucis, uh, doesn't match with the, with the looking at the images. Uh, yeah. Um, I think it's a different uh, discourse. So the Melito Hallucis was, uh, it was the assembly of the Athenians in the, uh, theater of Dionysus, so th it was a uh, it was a crowd that was so emotionally uh, overwhelmed that uh, um, that the archon had to f forbid it, and the uh, the discourse on the vases maybe was uh, was for 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 a small group. Uh, so I don't want to say that they didn't have feelings, but <laughs> so the, it's not the the great uh, population that suffered and the aristocrats didn't suffer. That I didn't want uh, to say, but it was a more uh, more private call, uh, discourse, maybe. But and I don't want. Uh, I really want to to stress again that it was not an illustration of the of what has happened, but only just that it came to the mind. As I said, all the topics were 
uh, were, um, were presented on, in the images since the early 6th century, only that they come together in this, uh, in this context. And we have the brutal um, acts of the aggressors, but also combined with the positive uh, experiences of Ayas and, uh, and the son of Theseus. Thank you. Athena. And, uh, Athena. Athena. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, that's a good point. Thank you. That's why I um, mentioned that um, three of the very few vases that, uh, that show the combination are on the Athenian Acropolis. And uh, I think that this point um, of um, Athena, that's why I told the story of the afterlife, of the, of the deeds of the, of the transgressors, that Athena was a very, uh, very uh, strong person who, who uh, in her wrath of the sacrilege, uh, had to be taken very serious. And uh, uh, as to the, the first point of your remark, um, you see that the the uh, the outrages are in the middle of the of the, of the vase. You have the uh, the cut there with the handle, and so what you see when you 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 have the 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 hydria in your hand, you see first these utmost um, utmost brutal um, uh, transgressions of of Neoptolemus uh, on the altar, and next to it uh, Arias and um, and, um, um, and um, Cassandra. So I think that that is the point of the the vase. Um. Uh, thank you very much. Now we have uh, a coffee break. I guess. Yeah. Ich habe dich rausgehauen mit der Zeit. Ich habe dich rausgehauen mit der Zeit. Weil ich, weil ich, weil ich, weil ich kürzer war. Oder? Wie spät ist es? Halb eins. Ach so. Und dann ist ja wirklich, dann ist ja gar nicht so. Oder? Wie? Sind wir in Time? Er hat mir gesagt, ich soll kurz sein, damit noch Zeit für Questions sind. Also wir haben vier Stunden für... Ja. Thank you so much. It, it went...